everyone. Hello, welcome. I'm Pam Schaff, and I am the director of Keck School of Medicine's Humanities, Ethics, Art, and Law program, or the HEAL program. I want to welcome you all to our uh, second annual Artist and Researcher event. And I want to thank you for coming, and I want to thank especially the Dean's Office and the Department of Family Medicine for their support of our program and our support particularly, their support particularly of our artist in residence, Ted Meyer. Yay. I also want to thank all of the artists and researchers who are here and who together have created the incredible exhibit that you see today and that we'll hear more about. This exhibit um, is, as I said, number two. Last year's was a stunning success, hence number two. But um, it's the brainchild of Tad Meyer, who um, has been our artist in residence for two years now, and who um, came with this idea to, um, to, to pair artists and researchers. And I'm going to let him tell you how um, this idea came to him and why it's important to him, and um, explain a little bit about what you see here today. And then we'll invite some of our re artist researcher pairs to come and talk about their work. Hi. So, well, I've had this idea for, for ages, and I didn't really have a place to do it, but I love the fact that oftentimes science and art sort of work in a path, you know, and I just thought it would be really nice to pair people who normally would never have a chance to see each other and be part of each other's lives. And I really like the idea of some artists going into labs and seeing things that they would normally never get to see. And I gave Pam that suggestion, and she thought it was a good idea. And we put out a call to the researchers, and we weren't really sure. But the first year, we got overwhelming success from all the researchers. And then artists seemed interested. And there, there were a lot of great things that came out of it last year. Two of the artists landed up working in labs for a while. And they, everybody loved, well, they needed real income. So that was, <laughs> and uh, I don't know, it just, it went great. So we thought we'd do it again, and hopefully we'll do it again next year. Personally, I have a very rare disease. And there was research being done. I gave blood when I was five years old. And it was 42 years later where that giving blood finally landed up coming up with a treatment for what I had. Wow. So I know that a lot of you researchers are in this for the long run. And this is sort of a way to say thank you to you guys because I know that sometimes your work can last decades and lifetimes and sometimes even surpass you guys. Um, so that's it. Cool. Thank you. So. Um, Last year, what we did, which was really fun, was invite uh, anybody, any pair who wants to start us off, but to have an artist and researcher pair come up and just tell us about what the process was like for you, what happened um, while you were collaborating, and what did you learn, and what do you want to share with us? So who might be our first volunteer? <laughs> Hi, my name is Francesca Mariani, and I am a faculty member over in our Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Center, that beautiful black building that's um, on the edge of campus there. And um, I had a wonderful time working with Emily. We uh, met and talked about all the research going on in my lab. We're interested in how bones repair, what the mechanism is that facilitates uh, repair, what stem cells might be involved, and how we could potentially uh, improve um, large-scale bone repair. And um, we went back and forth, and it was uh, really interesting. Actually, Emily's done a lot of painting, so this was kind of a new uh, adventure for her to, to do something more sculptural. And so um, maybe, you can, maybe you can talk about how you came to where you, to the piece that you created. So Francesca described her work, which is this is, I'm going to just slay what, what she does. <laughs> but she works with um, trying to heal bones. And she starts with uh, mouse bones, removing parts of mouse ribs, and then with the hopes of having those bones repair and then taking that process over to humans. So people who've had um, bad injuries or just mangled bones one day don't have to have the treatment that they have now, which isn't um, 
isn't as good as the natural process. So with my piece, I started with um, a microscopic cell of a bone callus, and then the piece goes uh, clockwise, where I, I obviously didn't use mouse bones because you'd need bigger glasses to see. <laughs> and so I, I used uh, bones um, from animals where a piece was cut out, and I, I used the same sort of color palette as in the, um, the bone slide for aesthetic purposes. And then uh, I cut out a piece of the bone, and then in between I tried to mimic the magic that happens. And so I, I used a biomorphic material. In this case, it was um, flower parts, like faux flower parts. And then as you go up in a circle, it becomes, it goes from pink and red to white, becoming more like solid bone until it's got bone fragments in it until you end at the very top with a piece of solid, firm bone, which is the goal. Yeah. So how did I do? That's great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> So thank you for including yeah, me. Thank you Thanks, so much. Ted. So um, I'm Afsane Barzi. I'm a medical oncologist, and my research is um, around decision making. There is a concept that's called shared decision making when we have very difficult decisions to make, a lot of information on the physician side, and a lot of fear and worries on the patient side. What we say, how we say, and how we help bridge the gap of coming down with a decision is really critical and a topic of research that's not limited to one field but goes across the medicine and many other fields where the decision making is important. So we met and I very briefly explained um, to Lauren um, what my vision is and how it is. And just a few minutes ago, he was explaining to somebody what it means and I thought his explanation was better than mine. <laughs> So I'm going to let him explain. I have to say I'm impressed with the work. I like the fact that it's a big piece of work that overarches everything. Basically, like I said, decision making is big. Um, it has um, the confusion that's involved on both sides when you're deciding about how to move forward. But then when you focus into it, you actually see clarity. You see very clear pieces. And I think that's the beauty of the of the artwork he has done. So I'll let him explain what the, what the research is about. It's hard to follow that one. Um, anyway, I'm Lauren Phillip. Uh, it was a real honor to be invited to be part of this uh, very unique and, and special ex, uh, exhibit. And when I met, uh, when, when I met her, it was, it was like it was cosmic. The, the things that she was starting to talk about were things I was already interested in, which is uh, a more holistic approach to patient profiles. Um, you know, so often you're, there's so many choices, so many options for treatment. And um, one of the, the most dynamic sort of forms of, of finding some of those uh, proper treatments are to know your patient at a deeper level than just their disease, but to know what makes them tick, what makes them uh, joyful, what makes them really, you know, what, what gives them joy in life, what, what brings that to them. And so I think what um, you've been so sort of working with is this element of getting that information as part of what is just as much, you know, uh, as your, your vitals and all of this. is like having it, you know, a, as solid as this, is so that information can move with you. So as you get treated, the choices are faster because they already know what you can't live without. So if you are sensitive to, to, to your eyes, you're a photographer, you, you love to paint, you know, you're, you're already gonna know that we don't wanna prescribe something that's gonna reduce color sensitivity or depth perception or something like this. Uh, if you're a, a pianist or a violinist, you know, it, whether professionally, especially professionally, but perhaps even just as a hobby, you know, doing something where maybe um, one of the treatments makes uh, your fingertips a little dull. This would not be good for somebody who loves to play piano every night, things like this. And so those, these concepts 
really, they really struck home with me because I think that this is really where, where medicine can, can ultimately really just fill in all the gaps and start really treating you know, the whole person. And so the piece is, is titled uh, At the Speed of Choice and it is re reacting to the element of, of that acceleration of the possibilities of, of the, the various avenues of treatment can be taken and, um, and the positive healing that can come the faster and the more directly it's, that's associated with the patient. And so this is, this is what we came up with. Thank you. Okay, I'm Elizabeth Sowell, and um, I'm a professor of pediatrics, and all of my work uh, is done, well, where I live and work is at Children's Hospital, Los Angeles. And I do um, brain imaging research in kids, so I like to say I, I do kids' brains, that's what I do. Um, and I was really excited about the opportunity to work with an artist, which turned out to be Alex, because I myself um, am a, a uh, hobby artist. I, play, I paint flowers. And um, I always like to think of my work because a lot of what I do is, is brain imaging, using non-invasive magnetic resonance imaging in kids. And a lot of the work we do is how do we visualize what's going on in there? And a lot of time it involves color and, and shape. And so it, it, I, I just was really um, resonated with the idea of working with an artist. And, and honestly, my own artwork is very um, literal color, you know, trying to make things not exactly real, but what's in here coming out there. And so I can't wait for him to explain what he came up with. But the, the, the project that I explained to him in more depth than he probably wanted to hear was a, a new study that I'm uh, part of, an investigator on. It's called the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. And it's an NIH-funded project um, that is, is uh, being done to try to understand how brain change over time in kids um, relates to things in their environment. So I'm really interested in socioeconomic status and how that impacts the brain and cognition. I'm interested in how environmental toxins like air pollution and lead exposure can impact the brain. I'm interested in how puberty and hormones change the brain. So, um, but this study is massive. It's, it's uh, 21 different sites around the country at universities. Uh, we're recruiting 10,000 nine and 10 year old children. We're doing brain imaging, cognition, biomarkers, DNA, um, baby teeth that can explain if anyone wants to ask me about it later. Um, and all of this data, we're gonna study these kids for 10 years to try to get an idea of what's going on. And Alex had to listen to that and try to come up with something, and I'm so impressed with what he did, so. Well, I'm impressed with what you are doing. <laughs> this is, um, for me also, it was a pleasure to meet Elizabeth and to have uh, the privilege, actually, to spend some time with her. Um, and it was not really boring. Uh, it was actually pretty, pretty exciting. Uh, the problem I had when I left the meeting we had was how do I put all of that that you put together into one place? And that was not an easy thing to do. It took me a little while to settle on what is against the wall under the, um, under the emergency light. Um, what, I, what I took from your research was the, the, the degree of discipline and focus and, and uh, the desire to end up with something that will really improve the lives of people. When I compare what you do to what artists do, I would say that we're a little bit more flexible. We, 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 we let things sometimes kind of go in directions that we have no idea where we'll end up. Uh, perhaps that happens to medicine too sometimes, that you find the surprise leading into something new that you did not consider. So after I collected everything that you said and I read the things that you sent to me, I decided that I wanted to make a metaphor. So what is under the emergency light is a vessel. Uh, inside the vessel, there is an electronic system that beeps um, a red light. Now, with this ambient light we have here, it's very hard to see it. But if you put your palm over the dome, you will see the light 
pulsing. To me, the first thing was this is life as it represents itself through the beating of the heart. And then the vessel is a place where all of the information that you collect eventually will, will bring something to the rest of us. It's like the Aladdin um, lamp. And so I, I, I couldn't really illustrate it any better. I thought the best way to do it is to find something that really speaks to the, to the, to the, to the overwhelming uh, task that you all have taken throughout the United States with all of the children and their families um, and, and try to reduce it into something that is manageable and, and maybe if one would to spend a, a little bit of time will find it interesting visually and maybe perhaps conceptually. Um, at the end of the day, um, it took me only a few days and I had to reach out to people that knew how to make certain things because I had never done anything like that. So this is almost a collaboration between me and somebody else who knew how to get to the outcome that we have here. But I would say that although uh, it's only a three-day thing or a 10-day thing, at the end of the day, it's everything in our lives that we put into the research that we do that also brings about the outcomes that we have. Um, artists do not just show up and do things. Artists, in some ways, develop a life around the projects that they're interested in. And they hope that through the making of the art that they make, they, they contribute to the conversation. They open up ways to look at the world. Um, what, what I would like to say one more time, I'm extremely flattered that I had the chance to work with you. And, and also, I would like to thank Ted for his really great work in combining the science and the arts into one place with his remarkable work that is here tonight. Hi, I'm Joyce Javier. I'm a pediatrician at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and we're, I was teamed up with Francisco Alvarado. I um, also have two of my team members here, Apple Sepulveda and Jed David. Uh, they're occupational therapists, and our team is called Team Kapwa. And Kapwa means um, togetherness in Filipino, and, or Tagalog. And our research has been focused on using evidence-based parenting interventions to prevent adolescent mental health disparities among Filipino youth. Uh, I grew up in a Filipino immigrant family and had seen a lot of adolescent suicide in our community, but it's a highly stigmatized topic, and so it made a lot of sense to partner with an artist to try to create a culture of mental health and healthy parenting in the Filipino community. And so we met, and when we uh, first met with our whole team, which is an interdisciplinary team, um, we each kind of shared how we use the strengths of the Filipino community to address such a highly stigmatized topic. And maybe I'll pass it on to you to see how, you know, this, you came up with your, your piece. <laughs> Thank you. This has gotten to be the most challenging project I ever taken. Uh, I am very grateful for that because I, I do welcome challenges, but more importantly is the work that they do that I was so amazing. You know, I cannot think of, uh, personally, I cannot think of any other thing that is better for me or the people that I relate to that try to help somebody else and save somebody's life. So when I met with the team, being an immigrant myself and raising a son, I'm originally from South America, and I marry a Japanese woman. So my son is Japanese South American. So a lot of the experiences that they were feeling within the Filipino community, and a lot of the values that they hold, which are very important to them, family values, cultural values, is something that strengthens their community, and it helps the children to grow. So how could I represent that in an art piece? And what came to mind was actually a picture that I saw on Facebook, and it was this individual suspended in a hammock. And it gave me the idea of a spider web. It's fragile, yet very strong, depending on the pillars that support you. And the pillars that support you in all cases is friends, family, and the knowledge that that network brings to you. So my piece is that a spider web in the back. And it's made up of three pillars, uh, one for friends, one for family, and at the bottom of that is the letter K representing Capua, the knowledge and the strength that you get from your network. So thank you very much. Thank you.
Hi, I'm uh, Dr. Martin Kast. I am a cancer researcher here at the Norris Cancer Center, and I've specialized in a virus, which is human papillomavirus that causes cervical cancer. Um, and in my research, I am very much helped by a particular cell line. That cell line is called the HeLa cell line. And it is a cell line that was derived from a patient, Henrietta Lacks, in 1951. Uh, and this cell line has, since 1951, so for the last 67 years, continuously grown. And um, I could easily see or envision that this whole building would be filled with her cells. There have been tons of uh, uh, kilograms of, of her cells produced uh, throughout the world in thousands of research labs and also in um, uh, companies that use these cells to produce certain proteins uh, that they can sell for quite a lot of money. Now there's a whole history about this because her cells have literally generated billions of dollars in profit. But Henrietta Lacks never profited from it. She died, her family never uh, got any um, proceeds from uh, her cell lines. And it is uh, reflective of the time because in 1951 there were no informed consents. Uh, and by the way, physicians and scientists didn't even know that they could, could grow cancer cells in the laboratory. And her cell line was the first one. So because her cells are still alive, she became immortal. And that being immortal led to an inspiration of a author, Rebecca Sclote, who wrote uh, a book that came out um, just a few years ago, and it's called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. And just look at the name, Henrietta Lacks, he, la, is the, uh, that's why the name der is derived from. And it led to a movie that came out in 2016, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, uh, in which um, Oprah Winfrey plays the role of Henrietta Lacks. Um, and uh, so this cell line truly inspires the research in my lab. And then when Glenn Wagner came to visit my lab, of course we proudly showed him a flask of HeLa cells. And, and like we are always and still are, he was also struck by the sheer beauty of these cells. And that was the inspiration for Glenn to uh, paint, uh, the painting that you will uh, describe, in which HeLa cells are depicted. Yeah, this, this was actually a real struggle for me. Um, this is nothing like the art that I typically make. Um, I didn't quite know what I was going to do, and I kept looking and looking online, and I saw all these cells, and they, I was struck with how beautiful they were. And so I thought, well, maybe I could just make a painting of that, and even though it's not beautiful in, in terms of being cancer and it can kill you, but there is a beauty in it. And so I wanted to make kind of an artistic rendering um, capturing the beauty of it. So hi, I'm Paula Cannon. Um, and when Ted asked me to be involved in this, I was kind of excited until Ted told me I'd been assigned a photographer. And as uh, any woman of a certain age in the audience will know, that in initially freaked me out. Um, <laughs> However, JD was an absolute delight to work with. He, um, was, he came and visited me in my lab. I worked with viruses and stem cells. He was so interested in what I was doing, or he was such a good actor, that I found myself carried away telling him about all the things that I did. And before I knew it, I, we'd, I'd, we'd set up a photo shoot. I think the photograph he did, honestly, I, I love it, even though it's you know, not the photoshopped, airbrushed, a portrait I was hoping for, um, <laughs> because I, I think it, it, it actually says something about the, um, the juxtaposition of science and creativity that although I'm a scientist and, you know, we have stereotypes of what scientists are, oftentimes what we do is very creative and, and how we think about the elements that we worked with. You just heard Martin talking about his personal involvement with HeLa cells. I, I feel that way about viruses, these horrible little evil things that I'm actually kind of fond of. And I think that's kind of what you, what you saw when we talked, wasn't it? This is JD. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, as, we, as Paul and I were talking, uh, we were paired randomly, and I was so happy to be paired with Paula. We got along so well with each other, very well. Uh, as she was talking about working with viruses, she kept making hand gestures as if she was holding the virus. And what I understood is that, as she talked about her research, is that it's not just objective. It's not just looking in microscopes and you know, accumulating data. It's relational. 
she had a relationship with these viruses that she's working with. And it was clear from that moment, we, we, we formulated together what we thought the photograph should look like. And so we met, and th the hardest part of this piece was getting the virus. Where do you find a virus that you can represent for someone to hold? So uh, I was actually able to get that 3D printed. I learned all about 3D printers. And uh, so that she could hold it for the photograph. And uh, I hope that it conveys the intimacy that she conveyed about her work with viruses. Um, and I'm just such an honor to be here, to be paired with Paula. Thank you, Ted. And, and also to be a photographer among fine artists. Yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah. Nice to be here. So I just want to say something, sort of what Glenn was talking about is how beautiful a cell or a virus or something can be. And I've always, one of the reasons I like this show and thought about this is I love science and I was, I love science, pure science, and I love seeing images of cells in the universe. They always, there's a perfectness to it. And I was really hoping that people could capture that. And as far as the people I picked for the show, I picked a lot of people that I knew didn't do real literal work, because I sort of wanted to challenge people who normally did patterning. I wanted to see if they could tell a narrative or something. And I just think everybody's done a great job. And thank you all on both sides of the, the aisle here. Oh, that's a perfect setup for me, thank you, because I'm a narrative person. I'm a writer. I study literature. And um, I have not always had the easiest relationship with visual art. And I find that what I'm most excited by in this show and, and the others as well is that um, the ways in which stories get told um, on the canvas open up conversations and open up ways of understanding that I think benefit both art and science and of course medicine and all of our patients. So thank you for, for the idea. Thank you all for being here and being a part of this. And I hope that you'll continue to explore and enjoy and we will ask um, the artist researcher pairs to stand in front of their art and talk a little bit about it as well. Those of you who have or haven't, um, Nigel will be taking um, little videos of those conversations so we can archive those and we'll have a website where you can all review it and we'll be able to share it more broadly. So thank you so much. Thank you all. Really interesting, exciting thing, mixing science and art, which I feel like I have always done uh, with my research and involved, involves sort of visually colorful and stimulating things, uh, but there's also a lot of data and brain imaging in kids. And the adolescent brain cognitive development study is what I spent a lot of time uh, telling Alex about. And it's a huge amount of data from 10,000 children, brains and genes and cognition and baby teeth. Um, and Alex took my discussion of all of this data and came up with a conceptual idea that I find fascinating. Well, I could not really manage all of what you gave me, so I had to find a way to reduce it and reduce it quite, quite well so it can fit into this vessel here. Because I do believe that all of what is collected eventually is going to bring something that will be important to the world. And that's why it's shiny too, it has kind of a precious quality to it. But I also have placed, and I don't know if the camera can pick it up, a light inside and maybe the red that is reflected in my palm, which you can see, it is the pulse of life, the way that I see that the research, it is going to benefit. So I'm very, very happy and pleased to have met you and to have worked with you. And, and it's, I'm astonished by what you do as an art, as, as, as a researcher. And, and I would like to keep you in, in touch and, and connect it. Absolutely, and I can't wait to share these images and pictures of the art with the many, many, many researchers, scientists around the country who are working on the Adolescent Brain Cognitive Development Study. I think they'll enjoy it too. Very good. Thank you, Elizabeth. Appreciate it. So my name is Brian Luna, and I study antibiotic-resistant uh, bacteria. So our lab is interesting in studying everything from how these bacteria cause disease, and then we also want to look for new interventions. So we're trying to develop antibiotics or develop vaccines and that kind of thing. Um, when Christine and I first met, we, one thing that kind of stood out to, to both of us is when we look at bacteria that are grown, they have so many different colors and shapes and textures and things like that. 
I think some of that kind of led to the inspiration of what we see here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, when Brian and I met, I went to his lab and I was struck by, of course, like I'm a process artist, so all the like bells and whistles of the lab. Um, and then I think, I don't remember if we actually went on the internet while I was there. I think so. Yeah, we looked up some of the pictures. And, yeah, you showed and, me some of the pictures yeah. of the bacteria that was growing and, you know, same thing. And I actually went home and I bought um, uh, those um, peanuts, the packing peanuts, because they're the perfect shape of some of the bacteria yeah. that you were growing. And I was actually going to paint some of those and figure that out, but that didn't work. <laughs> but I thought about like the process, you know, because I am a process artist, and I thought about the process of growing the bacteria and what that means and how that works. And so I actually had petri dishes at home, and I poured paint in the petri dishes and kind of grew the paint. And once that dried, I peeled the paint out and I poured it or put it in the flasks. And then I kind of thought of like the mad scientist lab and, you know, because I'm a drip and pour and messy artist. And so I just kind of started having fun and there's still even wet paint in some of these. And then I also thought about the idea of like viruses and resistance and I thought glitter. <laughs> you know, glitter is like, it's everywhere. It's um, and then, you know, as I was reading Brian's one sheet, he talked about like what he does with the escape pathogens. And so I came up with the title of um, You Cannot Escape Resistance is Futile. And so I thought that was kind of a play on words and it was funny and, you know, um, but yeah, no, it was fun and it was a joy working with Ted, Brian and, you know, Ted was amazing as a curator. So thank you. Thank you. Cast was expecting possibly a woman who would be more familiar with the type of treatments that he does. And I thought, oh my God, what have I gotten myself into? And just starting to get into it, it was really fascinating to hear him talk about it. Um, and as soon as I got more into the project, um, I was able to come up with something. So, one. Uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's uh, funny how this works because I'm a professor in three departments. Uh, and so I am a professor in urology too. And so therefore, as Glenn has experience with uh, urological uh, diseases, he thought that by talking to me, that I was going to talk about prostate cancer or other male cancers. And, and I wasn't because I really am an expert in HPV and, and therefore cervical cancer and the other cancers that HPV causes, but it has nothing to do with male cancers. So therefore, it was almost shocking to him that we were paired because um, I wasn't working on male cancers. But I was convincing him very quickly that female cancers are very interesting too. Uh, cervical cancer is a major cancer in the world. Um, uh, we have, if you look worldwide, there are 530,000 cases of cervical cancer diagnosed every year and half of these women will die that year uh, in a year and that means that this is still the second or third leading cause of cancer death in women worldwide and so uh, it is a major disease um, and and uh, but the, 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 to fight the disease it really helped by this cell line that grew out of the cervical cancer cells from Henrietta Lacks uh, and as, as I explained a little earlier these cells keep on growing endlessly. They truly are immortal. Uh, and Glenn tried to depict this when he looked under the microscope and saw these cells and said, oh wow, they look beautiful. And to me, they are beautiful. And to the world, they are beautiful. Because yes, they killed Henrietta Lacks, but they gave uh, so much to the world in finding cures for the, actually this particular disease, several other diseases, um, and so um, her cells are immortal, she's immortal, and she did something very good for the world. And we got some art out of it. Yes. One other thing was I had bladder cancer about close to 20 years ago, and the thing that was kind of funny was about a month later they sent me an actual photo of the, the cancer itself, and again it was like very beautiful, it was like this bright reddish orange kind of ball of can cancer. You know, I was struck by that. So. Nature's perfect even yeah. when it can kill you. It is. All right, thank you guys. Thank You're you. You're welcome. Uh, I'm David Isaacson. Check, check. Is this, did you hear me? And, and uh, I'm a found object artist. I work and live in Oak Park, California. Uh, I uh, weld and join materials to make um, uh, humorous deconstructions out of everyday objects. 
And uh, for this piece, I've teamed with Alia, uh, our brave researcher, who does research into um, medical surveys for incarcerated populations. So what I thought would be interesting to do is that I work a lot with, like I said, with found objects and older materials. So I wanted to take my style and integrate it metaphorically into what's here. So I started with a clipboard, uh, an old time clipboard at that, and that was uh, for medical surveys or information gathering. Uh, some brushes for the sanctity of the medical establishment. A turtle shell, because even if you're in prison, everywhere you go, you take your home with you. Uh, cameras for surveillance. And uh, these two um, numerical keypads for data entry. It also has a little timer here on the bottom, which you really can't see, but Alia suggested that because it, um, it links up with the fact that our research is very current. Uh, I'm doing what I can here. Is there anything more that I should say, you think? Um, I'll just give a little bit of background, more Please background do. into my research. Please do. So yes. I work primarily with Correctional Health Services at the Los Angeles, Los Angeles County Jail. I'm part of a team that's working to improve healthcare delivery to the incarcerated population. Um, and part of that is conducting a survey, a readiness survey, to assess whether the staff members within the jail system, many of whom who worked in this kind of entrenched system for a very long time, are prepared for the changes that are about to take place so that we can adapt our plan and make it as efficient and seamless as possible. So hopefully eventually we'll be able to say that we have very low mortality rates, we have very low chronic illness rates, our patients are cared for as well as they would be in the community. Absolutely. And it's awesome to see how David took all of that kind of conceptual stuff and translated it into a really interesting unique visual that I hope you well, I'm very happy perspective. I'm very happy that it translated as well as it did and that you liked it I was very concerned that you wouldn't when you told me that your aunt made found object art I was like well I got a chance but I got to really make one of my best pieces in a while and I think I pretty much achieved it I'm pretty happy with what I made yeah, it's really great. okay I'm Monica Wyatt and unfortunately my brilliant amazing researcher isn't here Dr. Taiwei Wu so I will try and fill his very big shoes and tell you a little bit about what he's doing. Um, when I first met Ty, he sort of set the scene by saying the baby room's painted, the crib's been set up, and mom's had a fantastic, easy, perfect pregnancy. And just before or during delivery, something catastrophic happens and oxygen or blood uh, is, is lost for the baby. And be it the umbilical cord is tied around the baby's neck or the uterus has ruptured or something really horrible has gone wrong and oxygen's been cut off to the baby's brain and there's, there's brain damage. So what um, Ty and his research team have figured out and are, are continuing to, to work on is that they found out that if you could cool the brain and the body by exactly three degrees, there's a chance that you can resuscitate some of the dying brain cells. So what they use are cooling blankets. And um, I was struck that when big events happen, like the birth of a baby or a wedding, um, quilts are given. And in, in this case, uh, rather than the quilt being used to, to warm and comfort the baby, um, I devised a quilt that would cool the baby. So um, with the help of my wonderful sewing friend, Susan Curland, we put quilting batting in between two of these blankets and quilted them together. And then um, Ty gave me uh, lots of different apparatuses that are used in the neonatal room. And I, um, as an assemblage artist, what I love to do is transform these materials into something else. So I deconstructed the newborn's um, oxygen mask and put two of them together and filled them with some of the different tubing that is used. And um, to me, they they represented a baby in utero, or a baby's brain, or a newborn's heart, or an oxygen molecule, all these different elements that are, are so pertinent to what 
Ty is doing. Um, these are uh, neonatal blood collection tubing. Um, and so this is called Quilt, and it's intended to cool the baby and, and hopefully help. Okay, so my name is Dominic Oliazzi. My researcher was uh, Cecilia Patina Sutton, and um, she's not here, so I'm gonna just read a few of the comments that I uh, wrote down during our meetings um, in our conversations just to kind of inform this piece before I talk about the piece. So basically she does work and research on communications between doctors and patients, trying to better uh, bridge the gap for patients to better understand and retain the knowledge and the information that they get from doctors. And so she talks a lot about shared experiences um, and meaning the, uh, the experience is shared between the doctor and the patient. Um, she uses qualitative and quantitative research methods, creates surveys, questionnaires, things like that. And um, so she meets with a lot of different people from diverse backgrounds, talking about specific symptoms that they have, effects of the disease on their lives. And she uses that to capture the right words, um, it, the right words in communication to bring those words to the doctors to kind of better um, season them with uh, words that the patients are more familiar with, can better un understand and eventually lead to a better quality of care. Um, and so basically underlying the whole thing, she wants to enhance the conversation and make sure there isn't any unfair conversations or unfair exchanges. And so um, talking with her about that, I wanted to use the work that I had been making in the studio for a few years and kind of infuse her content and her, ser her research into the work that I had already been making, um, which is on hospital gowns. And so I'm very familiar with this act actual process because I've been a patient for 35 years of cystic fibrosis and I've had a double lung transplant. So I've been in and out of the hospital and I, I knew exactly what she was talking about with these kind of doctors sometimes speak over the patient's ability level um, different types of issues play in terms of how the patient can receive that information. So I, I knew from firsthand experience that those were issues and I was uh, blown away by the research that she was com coming up with and the techniques to better help doctors uh, communicate with patients. So for this, I thought about some of the work I've been working on and some of the work she'd working working on and I thought about this idea of um, sentence diagramming and a, as a, a starting point for me to be able to show or abstract this idea of uh, an, e an examining of language and examining of communication. So a sentence diagram is just a, a visual way to break down a sentence and analyze its parts, the subject, verb, predicate, noun, things like that. And so it's actually a visual drawing, representation of how a sentence works. And so I thought about that as my starting point for this. And so I used, I used that. And then the second part uh, of my starting point was to think about access and this access to information and knowledge through communication with doctors. So I thought about access as a door. So this, the vinyl tape is basically a tape outline of a door. And then... In, inside and outside of the door are these canvas panels made out of uh, hospital gowns. And so there are six of them that are equal size, square, and then there are two that are rectangular that are different sizes. And so two of them are actually in the doorway almost fully, and, you can, and they're revealed um, to be full hospital gown, you can make out everything that's there. But the other ones that are on the periphery overlap the doorway, so the parts that not inside the doorway are, are less accessible are painted black. And that is kind of like a void of information or like this idea that they're not fully there yet, they're not fully accessible. 
And then the parts that's inside the doorway are the revealed gowns. And so you can kind of see, recognize that they're patient gowns. And it was kind of a little bit more of a literal way to bring in the idea of the patient. And then the last thing that I was thinking about is like um, this knowledge tree. And so it kind of, it looks like a doorway, but then it has like some parts that come in and out of it and kind of creates almost like this tree or like a tree of knowledge type thing. And then this, this piece that extends onto the floor is like the roots. But also it, it, when a viewer is interacting with the piece, it's this confrontation whether or not they can actually step in. Is this like a boundary area where they have to stay out of? Or can they step in? And um, so I've noticed a lot of people during the opening have kind of been double checking themselves during, while they're interacting with this piece whether or not they can actually breach this line and things. So that's kind of a, a, another, another aspect I felt in my experience with patient communication with doctors. Am I, how much am I allowed to question a doctor? How much am I allowed to access them? Because they've basically been accessing me this whole time. How much am I able to access them, question them, and bring, up, bring into any of my personal in, issues with them and so it's this kind of like hesitation there, and that's, um, that's this. So th that's basically the piece. It came out a, a little bit more conceptual than I was originally planning, but, and there's actually no text or verbal communication in it at all, which I f eventually, when I finished, found interesting. And um, so I think maybe a follow-up to this piece would be a video piece with some audio and some sound too would be nice um, as like a sister piece to this so that's it and the, the the piece is called patient parse tree and the parse tree is just another name for the sentence diagramming uh, my name is Tony Pinto I did this piece with my wife Adrian Grace we worked with Dr. Sahai here at USC uh, she is a specialist in migraines and treating them mitigating the pain that people feel. Um, we did a lot of research. She ex explained a lot about what migraines are like to us. Uh, we did a lot of research and it's so intensely painful that we thought it would be good to illustrate that but in a way that was kind of cartoony. So that when, uh, like if, if somebody saw this painting, if you suffered from a migraine, you would see yourself in this. You would go, that's me. That's what it feels like. So that's what we're hoping to achieve with this piece. All right, hey. I'm Lauren Phillip, and uh, I was uh, invited to partake in the researcher artist exhibition here at uh, Keck School of Medicine, USC, and um, it was a very fascinating process. I met with uh, my researcher, Dr. Barzi, and she's uh, she's working on some really interesting things. She's fascinated with uh, bringing in a more humanistic. Uh, data flow into the patient's uh, profile and so the work has to do with um, that acceleration of choice the piece is called at the speed of choice and it's dealing with the various avenues of treatment one can take but accelerating the choice process by pre-evaluating and having a deeper understanding of the patient's uh, desires, joys, life, the things that really make them tick. So beyond just uh, what is wrong with them, the work that she's been working with delves into what makes the patient a whole complete happy individual. And so determining the, the avenue of, of treatment fast and effectively in treating someone where the uh, side effects are not going to hamper perhaps their, their, their loves, their joys, their passions is so important. The example she initially gave me was uh, there was a pianist, or he wasn't a professional pianist, but as a hobby they loved to play the piano every night and they were given a drug that deadened the sensitivity in their fingers and this immediately sort of sent this patient into a bit of a more depression than they even perhaps had initially. Um, and so from that story and, and many others like that in the history of, of 
of medicine, um, Dr. Uh, Barsi has been working to develop uh, a program that really evaluates the, those elements of the patient that should not be diminished in any way possible, if possible at all. And so uh, coming up with, you know, uh, a treatment that doesn't affect what they're most joyful about. For instance, another example would be an artist or a photographer. You wouldn't want to treat them with something that would diminish their sight or depth of field or color perception, whereas maybe they could be okay with a little numbness of fingers, but they wouldn't want anything to happen to their eyes. So this concept played out in the work, uh, the acceleration of the, the various treatments, um, I work the palette in a positive, uplifting way. I want the work to be looked at possibly by patients, possibly by people within the field, and, and to feel that, that rush of hope that could be uh, in there, especially if the treatment is the right one. And so this is a little bit about what that's about, finding that right treatment to make that hope a reality. Hi, I'm Joyce Javier. I'm a pediatrician at Children's Hospital Los Angeles, and this experience has been really wonderful. Um, I use community-based participatory research, which means partnering with the community to address mental health disparities among uh, Filipino um, population and uh, working with Francisco we were able to start with just storytelling sharing each other's stories um, both being immigrants here and we kind of really asked the community you know what are the strengths of the community and how we should partner with them to um, prevent adolescent suicide and so um, I'll let him explain a little bit more about the process. Hello, I'm Francisco Alvarado <laughs> I'm originally from Ecuador, South America, and I have been here since 1969. So meeting with the, meeting with the team it was really a reality moment for me because being an immigrant, I faced a lot of the issues that the Filipino community was facing. New into the country, uh, working long hours, raising children, and more importantly is the impact that an uh, environment like that has on the children. And what I realized by working with the team, and the team is called the Capua team, which is the values of the Filipino community, which means a strength in collaboration. Yes. Then <laughs> I realized that it was a very fragile environment, almost like a spider web, easy to break, but very strong if you rely on the community and your network to sustain you. So the idea was to have something that you can show perhaps to a six or 12 year old and talk about the piece saying, if you rely on your friends, if you rely on your family, that builds up your knowledge, it builds up your capoa. And that essence is helping you build a network where you can relate to the people around you. So you will not feel any more isolated in this process. So that's how this piece came about. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much, Francisco. Thank you very much. <laughs> so my researcher, for her work does interviews, conducts interviews with patients to find out how they can better take care of their needs and better ways to serve the, me the public. And so she said, all I do, I use interviews. And I was like, oh, you don't have beakers or something I can <laughs> transform? And she's like, no, I just use these. And I had to really think of how I could translate that into a 3D object. And I was talking with friends and had a brain session and we kind of came up with, well, it'd be really interesting to put it on a lab coat and put all the information in the lab coat. Um, and I wanted to do something that kind of represented coverage, you know, putting all of this information out and trying to help cover. But the reason I put the color photographs inside of the hands is that all of these are anonymous and you don't know where they've talked to or whatever but they're all people that need to be served so I wanted to show um, that while it's hard facts it's also very um, important outreach to real people that are you know that's why I did it in color because they're real people with real problems and real needs so 
that's how I did it. Uh, I met Paula and was paired with Paula as part of this project, uh, sort of randomly, and it was a great, great parent. We got along very well. Paula told me all about her research, which started uh, research on the AIDS virus, and has evolved into genetically modifying that virus to actually work on other diseases. And as we talked, Paula was talking about her work, she started making intimate gestures as if she was holding the virus that she was working on. And we saw in collaboration what the subject of the photograph would be. And both had a very clear idea where we would go with it. And we think it turned out pretty I much like it. So I hope she's happy with it. I am. Do you know how good an artist he is? Not only did he produce a beautiful photograph, but he's also like a, a psychotherapist because he actually <laughs> allowed me to kind of relax, forget that he was kind of interrogating me and trying to think of an art project. And I got totally carried away telling him about what I did and my kind of love-hate relationship with viruses. And what I love about this picture is the way he's he's captured me holding the virus that I feel like I'm I'm both caressing it but there's a tension there isn't there I, I also think I'm on the verge of crushing it and that's how I kind of feel about these little bastards you know I want to really wipe them out but hmm, they're also kind of you know what I've been working on my entire life so yeah you were great to work with you were too very <laughs> very nice. we were we were very fortunate to be together.